Have you ever wondered about the shadows that shape the most enigmatic figure in the wizarding world? Today, we're diving deep into the life of Severus Snape, from his dark childhood to his complex relationships with Voldemort and Harry Potter. This is more than just a timeline. It's a journey through the life of a man who was a hero, a villain, and everything in between. Welcome to the untold story of Severus Snape. Point in life number one, the son of a witch and a muggle, 1960. Severus Snape was born on January 9th, 1960, to a pure-blood witch, Eileen Prince, and a muggle, Tobias Snape. This background led him to later call himself the Half-Blood Prince. Little is known about his parents, but from Severus's accounts, it can be inferred that his father was quite harsh. Severus grew up lonely, constantly witnessing his parents' arguments. They lived in the poorest area of a small town called Cokeworth, with Severus wearing his mother's old sweaters. Point in life number two, meeting Lily Evans, 1970. In the last part of Harry Potter, Harry witnessed a memory in which Snape met Lily. It was implied that Snape had seen Lily before this encounter. Harry got the impression that the boy had imagined meeting her several times before it actually happened. Severus was nervous and excited, and although the meeting was not easy, he managed to befriend Lily. They both had one year left before attending Hogwarts, and Lily was completely unaware of the magic school until Severus told her everything he knew. Point in life number three, entering Hogwarts and meeting Harry Potter, 1971. The day Snape and Lily went to Hogwarts was also the first day they met James Potter. He was sitting with them in the Hogwarts Express compartment and immediately became someone they both disliked. When Harry witnessed this memory, he noted that James appeared and behaved like someone who had been sincerely adored all his life. A contrast with Snape. James immediately started picking on Snape, mocking him for wanting to be in Slytherin and teasing him about his appearance. Point in life number four, James saves Severus from Lupin around 1974. Although Snape and Lily were sorted into different houses, they remained good friends for much of their time at Hogwarts. However, by the start of their fifth year, Severus became obsessed with showing the school that James Potter, Sirius Black, Peter Pettigrew, and Remus Lupin were not as great as everyone thought. He knew something was happening with Lupin, and when he followed the marauders, Sirius tricked Snape into going past the Whomping Willow, knowing that a werewolf awaited him. Fortunately, James intervened and stopped Severus before something very bad happened to him. A point in life number five, Snape calls Lily a mudblood, 1976. Despite James saving Snape's life, their relationship not only failed to improve, but actually got much worse. Severus realized that the Gryffindor had done it only to protect himself and his friends, not out of any genuine kindness. This led him to establish friendships with Slytherins, who were eager to join Lord Voldemort after Hogwarts, which Lily found distasteful. Everything finally crumbled on one fateful day in the summer of 1976. After an exam, Severus was sitting on the grass by the lake, and James decided to divert a bored Sirius's attention to him. Severus tried to defend himself, but failed. Soap suds came out of his mouth, and then he was hung upside down. Lily intervened to stop this, but Snape was so embarrassed that he said, I don't need help from a mudblood. Point in life number six, Snape adopts the name Half-Blood Prince, 1977. Snape's sixth year at Hogwarts was his first year without Lily as a friend, and it drove him further towards the dark arts. He took the secret nickname Half-Blood Prince, referring to his mother's maiden name and the fact that he was not a pure-blood wizard. Severus also began to make significant advancements in potion-making. In the textbook required for the more advanced study of the discipline, he made notes that revealed him as a highly gifted student. Point in life number seven, Snape informs Voldemort about the prophecy, 1980. Sometime after graduating from Hogwarts, Snape joined the Death Eaters. He aimed to prove himself 
to the Dark Lord in the best possible way. Though the circumstances of how he ended up there are unclear, Snape overheard a conversation between Dumbledore and Trelawney at the Hogshead. Trelawney was interviewing for the position of divination professor, but suddenly she made her first real prophecy about a boy born at the end of July who would defeat the Dark Lord. Hearing this prophecy, Snape immediately ran to Voldemort, but this prophecy targeted Lily Potter. Point in life number eight, Snape becomes a double agent, 1980. Realizing what he had done, Snape asked Voldemort to spare Lily Potter. Surprisingly, the Dark Lord agreed, but Snape did not quite believe him. He went to Dumbledore, warning him that Voldemort was targeting the Potters, though in reality, he only cared about Lily. In fact, Voldemort kept his promise. He easily killed James Potter, but when Lily stood to protect little Harry, the Dark Lord did not kill her immediately. He offered her a chance to step aside, which Lily naturally did not take. Lily sacrificed herself for her son, and what's worse, it was partly Snape's fault. To atone, Snape became a double agent, fighting on the side of good against the main threat to the wizarding world. Point in life number nine, first meeting with Harry, 1991. Severus first saw Lily Potter's son during the celebration of the start of another academic year. For the potions professor, it was a difficult encounter. First, he was able to see Lily's eyes for the first time since they were at school together. On the other hand, Harry was so much like James that Snape had trouble distinguishing between the two in his mind. Later, he told Albus that Harry was just like James in every way although the headmaster argued that Severus simply wanted to believe that. Point in life number 10, Snape becomes a double agent again, 1995. Throughout the school year from 1994 to 1995, Snape noticed his dark mark becoming stronger. This was a clear sign of Voldemort's impending return, but Dumbledore instructed Snape not to respond to the call as soon as the mark summoned him. Instead, Snape appeared before Voldemort a bit later after Harry's escape, claiming he couldn't come earlier as it would have raised Dumbledore's suspicions. In fact, the headmaster was aware of all this and Severus became a double agent again, a role perfectly suited for such a master of occlumency. Point in life number 11, Dumbledore shares his plans with Severus, 1996. Before the start of Harry's sixth year, Dumbledore summoned Snape to his office to examine an injury. The potions master found that the headmaster had contracted a very serious curse that would spread throughout his body within a year. Determined not to depart in such a manner and hoping to spare Draco Malfoy from tarnishing his soul with a task from Voldemort, Dumbledore asked Severus to deal with him when the time came. The headmaster also revealed the truth about the Chosen One to Snape who realized he'd been protecting Lily's son only for him to be sacrificed at the right moment. Point in life number 12, Severus becomes the headmaster of Hogwarts 1997. Ultimately, at the end of The Half-Blood Prince, Severus fulfills his promise to Dumbledore by killing him. This marked the end of his role as a double agent. The headmaster kept Snape's true mission in the strictest confidence unknown to anyone else. Since Hogwarts had lost its headmaster, a replacement was needed, and to the dismay of the entire teaching staff, Snape became the headmaster. There was no disputing this appointment. With Voldemort in power, he also dictated the appointments. However, Snape wasn't as bad a headmaster as it might have seemed. For example, he skillfully protected the children from the shadows and also took care of the professors. Neither Sybil Trelawney nor Firenze were expelled from the castle. He carried out his mission and waited for the time to tell Harry the truth. Point in life number 13, final moments, 1998. Although Voldemort obtained the Elder Wand, it refused to obey him. He concluded that this was because Snape had killed Dumbledore and now the Elder Wand effectively belonged to him. Voldemort reasoned soundly, but erred only in that the Wand did not belong to Snape, a fact he learned too late. 
At that moment, Voldemort ordered Nagini to kill Severus, and she was to be the one to do it. Why Nagini? Because Snape needed to be eliminated by magical means, but Voldemort feared that the Elder Wand, which supposedly belonged to Snape, could behave unpredictably. Harry witnessed Nagini attacking Snape in the Shrieking Shack, but was unable to help him. Snape asked Harry to collect his tears and view his memories through the pensive, thus revealing many details of Severus's life. Loved unraveling the mysteries of Hogwarts with us? Subscribe for more magical insights into Harry Potter's universe. Join our community of wizards and witches in exploring every spell and storyline.